Good morning. I've been advised that the ranking member is just running about five, uh, about a five-minute delay. So we're going to start with, without him. He'll be joining us, and uh, I thank him for his cooperation. And with that, the Committee on Homeland Security, Subcommittee on Counterterrorism and Intelligence will come to order. The subcommittee is meeting today to hear testimony from four very distinguished experts regarding Islamist ideology and Southeast Asia. I'd like to welcome the members of the subcommittee and express my appreciation to the witnesses who are here today, and I recognize myself for an opening statement. The spread of Islamist terrorism around the world is a major concern for U.S. homeland security. Addressing this threat requires steadfast monitoring and proactive actions in every corner where ISIS and al-Qaeda ideology is spreading. There are indications of ISIS and Islamist ideology spreading throughout parts of Southeast Asia that are reminiscent of this violent ideology's expansion in Yemen, Libya, Nigeria, Somalia, and elsewhere in Africa. In recent years, there have been several high-profile terrorist plots in the region, primarily linked to violent Islamist extremist networks. In 2016, there has been a number of attacks and security concerns throughout the region. In January, ISIS claimed responsibility for a coordinated attack in Jakarta, Indonesia, that claimed eight lives and wounded dozens more. In February, the British and Australian governments issued terror warnings for travelers going to Malaysia. On April 9th, ISIS claimed responsibility for an attack in which 18 Filipino soldiers were killed and more than 50 wounded. A few days later, Islamist terror group Awi Yusayaf, which has been linked to Al-Qaeda, and ISIS beheaded two Filipino hostages. In Bangladesh, five secular bloggers and a publisher have been murdered in the past year in attacks that appear to have been inspired by terrorist ideology. Just this past Monday, Islamist militants killed Zulaj Manan, an editor of, Bangladesh, editor of Bangladesh's first LGBT magazine. The U.S. Embassy in Bangladesh confirmed that Mr. Manan was an embassy employee and worked with USAID. A group linked to al-Qaeda in, in the Indian continent, AQIS, claimed credit for the attack. Also on Monday, Canadian Prime Minister Trudeau announced that Abu Sayyaf has killed John Ridsdale, a Canadian citizen who has been kidnapped from a resort in the Philippines, who had been kidnapped from a resort in the Philippines last September. Our thoughts and prayers go out to both of their families. Estimates of Southeast Asian fighters that have traveled to Syria to join ISIS range between 800 to more than 1,200. Public reporting highlights the creation of an ISIS military unit in Syria comprised of individuals recruited from Malaysia and Indonesia, known as the Malay Archipelago Combat Unit. Similar to what we have seen with Australians and Western Europeans, there are indications that some South, Southeast Asian recruits from this unit are trying to direct and inspire pro-ISIS attacks in the region. The presence of Islamist terror groups in Southeast Asia is not a new development. There are historical connections between the Southeast Asian region and Islamist terror groups. Al-Qaeda used a number of major cities in the region for meeting sites, including planning the September 11th attacks. While many have speculated that Al-Qaeda's influence has declined, in January 2016, Ayman al-Zawahiri, the current leader of Al-Qaeda, released a statement specifically addressing Southeast Asian Muslims and encouraged sympathizers in the region to attack U.S. interests. With both Al-Qaeda and ISIS seeking to recruit and radicalize in the region, the U.S. must be proactive in working with regional governments to counter the ideology and identify potential threats. Through today's hearing, we will hear from counterterrorism and regional experts about the current influence of ISIS in the region, efforts to address the threat, and what more the U.S. and allied nations should do to prevent this region from become a big, becoming a bigger source of fighters, funding, and operational plotting. Many are skeptical that the violent Islamists groups, extremist groups in Southeast Asia could present a real threat to U.S. allies, interests, or the U.S. homeland. This is the same skepticism that ignored the threats from Yemen, Nigeria, and Libya until they had grown out of hand. While rightfully focusing on Syria and Iraq in our fight against ISIS, we should not ignore the growth of extremist activity and ideology in other parts of the world. I uh, thank all the witnesses for being here today, and I will ask, do you want to make an opening statement, or should we wait for Brian and have him come in when he does it? Wait for Brian? I mean, I'll go ahead with the witnesses. Okay, we'll go ahead with the witnesses when the ranking member arrives and his prerogative, he can make an opening statement. Uh, 
I'd like to do now is introduce our witnesses. The first witness is Mr. John Watts, who is a non-resident senior fellow at the Atlantic Council's Brent Scowcroft Center on International Security. Prior to joining the Atlantic Council, Mr. Watts was a staff officer at the Australian Department of Defense and an officer in the Australian Army Reserve. Mr. Watts holds a master's degree in international law from the Australian National University and a BA in international studies from the University of Adelaide. Mr. Watts, you're the kickoff witness, and I recognize you. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, Chairman King, uh, Full uh, distinguished members of the subcommittee, I'm grateful for this opportunity to talk to you about this important issue. From the start, the Islamic State of Iraq and al-Sham, otherwise known as IS, ISIS, ISIL or Daesh, has had global ambitions. It has long stated its goal is to endure and to expand. It has sought to find fertile new safe havens and high-profile targets to attack. In Iraq and Syria, ISIS is under siege on multiple fronts. In recent months, it has suffered a number of high-profile defeats and has given up substantial amounts of land to its various adversaries. As it is squeezed within its self-proclaimed caliphate, the importance of finding new safe havens and new targets increases in order to escape allied bombing campaigns and to reinforce its narrative of success. The recent bold attack by ISIS-aligned terrorists in Jakarta, along with indications of additional planning activities in the Philippines, Malaysia, and Thailand, appear to indicate an increased interest and success by ISIS in establishing itself there. But calibrating the level of threat that they pose requires consideration of a number of factors, both encouraging and concerning. Southeast Asia is an attractive target for ISIS ambitions due to large Muslim populations, history of terrorist activities, and a long-standing desire by groups there uh, to establish a Southeast Asian caliphate. There is a precedent for this. Darul Islam was an Islamic insurgent movement that grew during World War II in opposition to Dutch rule. Following the declaration of independence in 1949, it found itself at odds with the new Indonesian government and used the political instability and weak governance at the time to grow in influence. By the late 1950s, it controlled extensive territory in West Java, South Sulawesi, and the Aceh provinces. Following a failed assassination attempt on the president, the Indonesian government cracked down on the group. By the late 1960s, it had been effectively destroyed. But the remaining elements of the group scattered across Southeast Asia and went underground. In the 1990s, remnants of that group developed into another with similar goals known as Jamai Islamiyah. JI was formed as a, a transnational network across Southeast Asia and sent soldiers to Afghanistan to train. Following the forced resignation in 1998 of Indonesia's second uh, authoritarian president, Suharto, JI fighters returned to Indonesia and used the, uh, again, weak instability, uh, the political instability and weak governance uh, to emerge and to renew insurgencies across several, uh, across several provinces and to conduct high-profile attacks, including the Bali bombings in 2002 and 2005, the Jakarta bombings of the Australian uh, Embassy in 2004, and several international hotels in 2005 and 2009. Following the first Bali bombing, the government cracked down on the group, and after a series of high-profile operations, many of its leaders were killed or captured, with the group uh, remaining as a degraded form today. The legacies of these groups are an important element in examining these terrorism in Southeast Asia today. As with DI, key leaders and veterans of JI went to ground and are now emerging as central players in the current evolution of the militants' groups. It's also worth noting that those areas once controlled by DI harbored lingering Islamic movements uh, seeking autonomy, which have on occasion broken out into open insurgency. ISIS has been targeting Southeast Asia aggressively with media and messaging for some time in local languages and style to appeal to the populations. For some segments of the population, this has been a clarion call. A number of groups have sworn allegiance, and there have been thousands who have declared uh, their support at public rallies. There are approximately 3,000 pro-ISIS pro websites in Southeast Asia, with more than 70% coming from uh, Indonesia. As you mentioned yourself, uh, Chairman, there are approximately 700 Indonesians who have travelled to India, uh, Syria and Iraq to fight, and, uh, which is nearly double that, the 400 that travelled to Afghanistan in the 1990s. We need to t keep these numbers uh, in context, though. 700 out of an Indonesian population of 200, uh, 250 million is minuscule, and the numbers of people travelling from Malaysia are about on par with Australia, despite having a much larger Muslim population. The vast majority of Southeast Asian populations reject Islamic extremism, and groups such as Nadlatul Ulama, which have 50 million supporters, preach an inclusive version of Islam that emphasises tolerance and rejects ISIS rhetoric. In fact, some Indonesian jihadist groups have uh, rejected ISIS because of its brutality and call it un-Islamic. Globally, the areas and populations of ISIS have been successful in attracting recruits, face uh, either 
economic hardship, weak political governments, authoritative leaders and, or persecuted minorities or a combination thereof. In Southeast Asia, these conditions are no longer readily apparent. Southeast Asian populations live in generally stable, well-governed and prosperous nations and are, uh, are not as oppressed or politically disempowered as Muslim populations in other parts of the world. While some still struggle with poverty, economic opportunity, corruption and adequate infrastructure, the region is broadly prosperous and the most people are experiencing improving economic conditions. The final reason for remaining optimistic about the uh, attacks was that the um, Jakarta bombings was amateur in nature. The training and weapons used were poor uh, and the effect was uh, very limited with uh, more uh, insurgents dying than, uh, uh, than victims. I'm uh, out of time, I can continue if you'd like or wrap up. Uh, while uh, Southeast Asian law enforcement is also um, highly effective at, at targeting um, groups, following the Bali bombings in uh, 2002, um, the campaign by the Indonesian police um, killed fi over 50 militants and arrested over 500, and the group Jamai Islamir is a shadow of its former self. That being said, there are some concerns that we still need to be uh, aware of. Despite the fact that they are broadly effective, uh, the recent attacks, as well as the um, bombing in Thailand at the Erwan Shrine, show that, that uh, terrorist attacks can and will continue to happen, and no police force is 100% effective at, at stopping them all. Moreover, while the groups that have sworn allegiance to ISIS do not currently have the capability or possibly intent to band together and strike on a national level, if ISIS reprioritizes its strategy and uh, looks at its current situation, um, it may uh, reprioritise the effort and the resources it puts into Southeast Asia, and that threat scenario can change rapidly. Sources from Syria and Iraq have indicated there is currently a split between various ISIS leadership factions as to whether they should prioritise retaining the current territory at all costs or devolve into a decentralised international terrorist organisation. If it does the latter, the likelihood of increased resources flowing to Southeast Asia could raise quickly. As moderate and tolerant Muslim-majority countries, Malaysia, Brunei and Indonesia are of great symbolic importance to ISIS because they repudiate the, the extremist rhetoric they espouse by demonstrating a better alternative to it. The success of Southeast Asian societies are antithetical to the apocalyptic and sectarian message for ISIS promotes. Muslim-majority countries are an important target, particularly Indonesia is the Muslim-majority country, uh, but their appeal there has been extremely limited and is, remains on the uh, absolute fringe of the already fringe jihadist uh, population. Thank you for this opportunity to testify. Mr. So, Watts, thank you. Thank you very much for that. Uh, our next witness, Mr. Patrick Skinner, is the Director of Special Projects for the Sufan Group. He is a former CIA case officer specializing in counterterrorism issues, and additionally, he has law enforcement experience with U.S. Air Marshals and the U.S. Capitol Police, as well as search and rescue experience in the Coast Guard, in the U.S. Coast Guard. Uh, thank you for your service, and thank you for being here today, Mr. Skinner. Thank you for having me, Chairman King, other members of the subcommittee. <coughs> Um, I try to break it down into two threats. Um, there's a long and well-deserved assumption that Southeast Asia is not fertile ground for extremism. And as pointed out, 99.9%, .9%, the vast majority of these people reject that. But that's also true in a lot of places. Um, there has been decades of e extremism in the area. As you mentioned, there is um, a threat of terrorism that has run for decades, uh, before Afghanistan, before 9-11, but continuing all the way through it. And so when it comes to ISIS, particularly, I, I break it down into two threats. You have the threat of the foreign fighters. And again, 700 Indonesians, maybe 1,200 in total, 50 Malaysians. Those are wildly, opt I mean, those are really positive numbers uh, per capita, I mean, compared to like Tunisia or Saudi Arabia. And, but as we've seen in Paris, it, it, just, it just takes a handful of people to come back and destabilize, especially when there's already political um, tensions and economic tensions, not as severe, but is always an undercurrent. And so the difference between Paris and the difference between Jakarta, so one killed 130, one killed four plus the attackers themselves, was training. It's not lack of opportunity, it's not lack of, lack of targets, it's training. And so there is a real concern. Now, everything with foreign fighters can always be either overhyped or downplayed, and so it's hard to split the difference because it's such an unknowable. But it is certainly knowable that the difference between success and failure, between cartoonishly bad plots, which are still tragic, but they're not a national security incident, is training. And ISIS has demonstrated the ability to, well, Syria has been a live fire training ground for three years for this group. 
and perhaps longer. And as we've seen in the EU, and we'll certainly see in Southeast Asia, the ability of governments to actually track extremist foreign fighters is wildly overstated. Even in the most technologically advanced countries, we are not tracking these people. We're, you know, we're building this hindsight after the fact counterterrorism machine. And so I think that it's, you should expect that some of these people who have left, not all want to come back you know, to fight. Some just want to come back because they're disillusioned and that's a positive development. But there will be people that will come back and I think that we have to presume that they will be undetected. Now, they do, these services are really good. And so that's one size of the threat is not lone wolves, but you can look at them like that, a little small cells where people come back and they know what they're doing. And that's a bad thing. Another issue, and it's also an unknowable, but we can begin to assume this might be the case, is that there are existing sanctuaries that Islamic State would love to plug in. There's no such thing as a clandestine caliphate. They, they need sanctuary. They actually need a place for these people to go to that they can say, this is where our flag is. And like places like the southern Philippines are a really attractive option for them because Abu Sayyaf has proven that they can be around for decades. They've proven that they can battle the Philippine police and the military, uh, at least to a standstill. And so the danger is that you take these already lethal groups that are like parasites that are plugged into the local economies with kidnapping, you know, for ransom, smuggling, extortion. And then you add the ISIS n notoriety, you add their funding perhaps, but you also add that lethality that these groups have, but not on the Islamic State scale. And so the concern is you have returning foreign fighters who will add a level of professionalism, if you want to use that word, to attacks. And that's the difference between Brussels and Jakarta. And th those are really big differences. Uh, one is a local crime issue, another is you don't want too many of these attacks. But then the bigger threat is the instability of these regions, and they're not going to get better immediately, and these places need help, especially the Philippines. They're, that's a military problem. And so ISIS is going to try to plug into that. They've, uh, it is an open question, but it's likely that they will declare like at least a wilayat, a state there. They haven't done it yet. They've accepted Abu Sayyaf on their, you know, the, the Pledge of Allegiance, but they haven't said, okay, we're going to have a wilayat. If they do that, that is a clear sign that they're going to move hard into the region. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Skinner. Uh, our next witness is Ms. Uh, Supna Zaidi Tapiria. Did I get that okay? You can correct me. Zaidi Piri. Okay. Is, is she, uh, she's an attorney and a strategic policy analyst at the Counter Extremism Project, a not for profit, nonpartisan international policy organization that combats the growing threat from extremist ideology. Ms. Piri's areas of expertise include the roots of extremism foreign policy, human rights, immigration, and development issues. She previously worked policy and intelligence analysis for the banking sector in New York City, and Ms. Piri has written extensively on foreign policy, human rights, and religion for more than a decade, and we welcome you today, and thank you for appearing. You're recognized. Thank you. Chairman King, Ranking Member Higgins, and members of the subcommittee, I appreciate the opportunity to appear before you today. ISIS is positioned to increase its threat to the United States and our allies in Southeast Asia by collaborating with local militant groups. In response, regional governments should aggressively seek out preventative policies to combat violent and non-violent Islamist activity in the region. These policies should include an aggressive push against the proliferation of Islamist propaganda online, especially on social media. Concurrently, regional governments must support and amplify counter-messaging spread by moderate Muslim organizations like Sisters in Islam in Malaysia and Nadlat al-Ulama in Indonesia, which Mr. Watts mentioned. Islamists, especially ISIS, skillfully manipulate regional and local problems and incorporate them into the Islamist message of global Muslim victimhood. Currently, there are more than 3,000 pro-ISIS websites in Southeast Asia. Approximately 70% of these websites are hosted on servers in Indonesia. This is an issue that the Indonesian government can address while we're with working with the private sector. Muslim youth can easily come into contact with this extremist rhetoric online and become vulnerable to radicalization. Nonviolent Islamist groups like Hizbut Sharia and Islamist televangelists like Zakir Naik empower ISIS by similarly advocating for Khalifat to replace local governments. In Southeast Asia, Hizbut Sharia events fill football stadiums by the thousands, and Zakir Naik reaches millions through his cable station, the Peace Network, and speaking engagements, which are later posted online. Earlier this month alone, Zakir Naik spoke at an event in Indonesia where he stated 9 11 was an inside job, among other questionable statements. 
The situation in Southeast Asia can be compared to the evolution of events in the United Kingdom where Islamist propagandists and Jim Chowdhury never reflected the views of the majority of Muslims in the UK, but the group he co-founded, al Mujahideen, is blamed by British law enforcement for at least 50% of terror plots in the UK from 1995 to 2015. Chowdhury's fringe status has not prevented him from undermining stability and security in Great Britain. Equally, extremist activity in Southeast Asia can dramatically negatively impact the region in the future if it's not curbed now. In the Philippines, for example, militant group Abu Sayyaf pledged allegiance to ISIS in 2014, despite being considered primarily a criminal organization. It is possible that the affili affiliation benefits Abu Sayyaf by raising its stature, making its kidnap for ransom business a more serious threat to foreign governments, including the United States. Abu Sayyaf reportedly beheaded a Canadian hostage, John Ridsdale, this week, who was working on a mining project in the Philippines and vacationing at the time of his kidnap. Abu Sayyaf had demanded ransom and apparently did not receive it by the group's self-imposed deadline. Any support ISIS and Abu Sayyaf give each other raises the security risk to local governments in the region, as well as to the United States, which ISIS identifies as a target through its online outlets. Moreover, ISIS-affiliated extremists in Bangladesh, which borders the Southeast Asian country of Burma, killed two more advocates of secularism on April 23rd and April 25th of this month, bringing the death toll of liberal writers in the country to eight since 2015. These victims do not include the foreigners and religious minorities that have also been targeted by Islamist extremists in Bangladesh in the last few years. Instability in Bangladesh has negative effects in Southeast Asia since extremists from Bangladesh have allegedly attempted to recruit from the Muslim Rohingya refugee population along the Burmese border. ISIS propaganda on various platforms play the images of starving Rohingya over and over again, striking a deep emotional chord among some vulnerable Muslim youth around the world to do something to help their fellow Muslims. Jihadist recruitment preys upon these emotions. There are similarly videos and images played um, on ISIS platforms of uh, the Syrian crisis, children, family, families suffering um, with no support from the outside. ISIS has targeted neighboring Malaysia as well. ISIS met multiple militant groups last fall in the Philippines to plan attacks to be committed in Malaysia. ISIS also has a presence in Indonesia where pro-ISIS militants attacked a Starbucks cafe in Jakarta, killing four on January 14th of this year. Arun Naim is considered the brains behind the operation, and he is connected to ISIS propagandist Abu Jindal in Syria and pro-ISIS ideologue Amun Abdurrahim. Abdurrahim has translated pro-ISIS propaganda from Arabic to Bahasa Indonesian online to help recruit jihadists. It should be uh, important to note that ISIS propaganda includes multiple languages along multiple platforms to ensure that its message is indeed global. Thus, the activities of ISIS and local militant groups in Southeast Asia confirm that extremism is on the rise in the region. But yet, it should still be pointed out, as my fellow witnesses have mentioned, that the uh, numbers of actual extremists are low. But if the UK is to serve as an example, more aggressive policies to challenge extremist rhetoric are critical to prevent extremism from spreading to the same levels as in other parts of the globe, in South Asia in the future. Consequently, we at CEP recommend that regional governments create policies to work with the private sector to take down extremist propaganda. And second, local governments should replace the extremist rhetoric with moderate voices. Two, two examples out of many um, from the region are include Nadlatul Ulama, which is an Indonesian clerical body that supports the indigenous and peaceful interpretation of Islam called Nusantara Islam. The ulama represents approximately 40 to 50 million members already. Uh, the ulama has also already denounced extremist rhetoric by ISIS using the hashtag We Are Not Afraid as a social media campaign. A second moderate voice is the Wahid Institute, founded by Yeni Wahid, the daughter of former Indonesian president Abdul Rahim Wahid. She is quoted as saying, We're not just coming up with a counter narrative, we're coming up with a counter identity, and that's what all this is about. We believe we're good Muslims, but to be good Muslims, we don't have to accept the recipes that are handed out by some radicals from the Middle East. Raising such pluralist voices will not only challenge ISIS extremism, but also marginalize separatist rhetoric for, espoused by groups like Hizbut Tahrir and individuals like Zakir Naik. To conclude, Southeast Asia has an opportunity now to respond properly to the growing extremist threat by addressing important identity issues and providing alternatives to the extremist messages churned out daily by ISIS and other Islamist groups. Otherwise, the threat to the region and other countries, including the United States, will only grow. Thank you. Thank you very much for your testimony. Uh, our next witness is Dr. Joseph C. Liao. He's a senior fellow in the Brookings Center for East, po East Asia Policy Studies. 
He is concurrently a professor and dean at the Raja Atnam School of International Studies in Singapore. He is the author and editor of 11 books and, monograph, and monographs. Dr. Liao holds a doctorate in international relations from the London School of Economics and Political Science. Dr. Liao, you're recognized. Thank you very much for being here today. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, thank you for this honor and privilege to be here today. Let me start by saying that any assessment of the ISIS threat in Southeast Asia must begin with the observation that terrorism is not a new phenomenon in the region. It goes as far back as the era of anti-colonial struggle, but gathered pace after 9-11 with a series of attacks perpetrated uh, mostly by the Al-Qaeda-linked Jama Islamiyah terrorist organization. Against this backdrop, recent ISIS-inspired attacks in Jakarta and the southern Philippines serve as a timely reminder of the threat that terrorism continues to pose to Southeast Asian societies. Related to ISIS, the threat takes three forms. First, the danger of attacks perpetrated by local groups or individuals inspired by ISIS. These groups or individuals might not have direct links to ISIS Central. Rather, they possess local grievances for which the abstraction that is ISIS provides impetus and inspiration usually via the internet. Jakarta was an example of this. Second, the threat posed by returnees from Syria and Iraq. In particular, the possibility that hardened militants would return with battlefield experience and operational knowledge to either plan or mount attacks back in the region. Thankfully, this has not yet happened. Thus far, the returnees in custody are deportees who failed in their attempt to get to Syria and Iraq in the first place. Third, the threat posed by militants who will soon be released from prison. At issue here is the weak prison system, particularly in Indonesia, and the radicalization that occurs within prisons. We should bear in mind, though, that not all of these soon-to-be-released militants are ISIS supporters or sympathizers. In fact, the vast majority are members of militant groups known to be anti-ISIS. There will be about 100 or so released from Indonesia at the end of the year. So how serious is the threat posed by ISIS? The threat is certainly real and warrants our attention for reasons I already mentioned. But at the same time, we must, be care we must take care not to exaggerate it. Let me make three points in that regard. One, when we speak of ISIS in Southeast Asia, we have to be mindful of the fact that at present, there is no such thing as an ISIS Southeast Asia, nor has ISIS Central formally declared an interest in any Southeast Asian country. For the most part, we are dealing with radical groups and individuals who have on their own taken oaths of allegiance to ISIS. Two, the number of Southeast Asians fighting in Iraq and Syria remains comparatively small. We are talking of at most 700, mostly from Indonesia. By way of comparison, thousands are coming from Europe. In addition to this, a large proportion of Southeast Asians there I would say around 40% comprise women and children under the age of 15. Three, in our anxiety over ISIS, we must be careful not to miss the forest for the trees. There are multiple militant groups operating in Southeast Asia. Many are at odds with each other. Not all seek affiliation to or are enamored of ISIS. In fact, I would argue that the greater long-term threat comes from a rejuvenated Jama Islamiyah, which has a larger network and is better funded than the pro-ISIS groups in the, region, in the region currently. What about terrorism in Southeast Asia more generally? Here too, it is imperative that we keep things in perspective. Yes, for Southeast Asia today, the question of terrorist attacks is unfortunately no longer a matter of if, but when. Even if the influence of ISIS diminishes over time, and it will, Terrorism is part of the lay of the land and will not be eradicated anytime soon. But terrorism, whether perpetrated by ISIS or Jama Islamiyah, is not an existential threat to Southeast Asian societies. All indicators are that from an operational perspective, the threat remains at a low level. Of course, given the resilience and evolutionary nature of terrorism, this situation might well change. As I alluded to earlier, one possible factor that could prompt a change is a deliberate shift of attention of ISIS Central to Southeast Asia. This, however, seems unlikely for now, 
as ISIS is preoccupied with its immediate priority of holding ground in Iraq and Syria and expanding its fight in Libya, Yemen and Europe. A final observation. Without being complacent, we should also recognise that regional governments are today better equipped and prepared to deal with the threat compared to a decade and a half ago. Although capacity can and should be further improved with cooperation among themselves and with help from the United States. Thank you. Let me thank uh, all the witnesses for their testimony. Uh, we've been joined by the ranking member, and Brian, do you want to make an opening statement or submit no, it for the record? Okay, the uh, ranking member will submit his statement for the record. And at the outset, I want to thank uh, Ranking Member Higgins for his support in this hearing and all the hearings prior to this. Uh, my uh, question is sort of broad-based, and it'll be to all of you, and it follows up on the really conclusion of Dr. Liao's uh, testimony. One thing that the European nations seem to realize since the attacks in Paris and Brussels, that there should be more cooperation among countries in Europe. I would ask you, do the countries in Southeast Asia, do they consider this a regional threat? Is there a level of cooperation among them? And also, uh, considering the outstanding work that's done by Australia, are they involved in any of this uh, sharing of information? Is there information shared? And are there regional plans? So I'll start with Mr. Watts. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, uh, good question. And I'll leave some of the details about the coordination between some of the, uh, the other governments in the region uh, to the other speakers. Uh, I can't say uh, specifically because I haven't um, had first-hand knowledge and I wouldn't, you know, it'd be, it'd be classified if it was, uh, of the degree to which the Australian government shares information with the Indonesian and other governments in the region. I can say that there is close cooperation. Uh, one of the, um, the key elements uh, that we didn't bring up was Detachment 88 in uh, Indonesia, which is a counter-terrorism unit that was stood up after the Bali bombings and was uh, funded and uh, had training support from both the Australians and the US, uh, FBI and, and others, uh, in terms of building capacity. That group is a, is a spearhead. Um, their approach to counterterrorism is something that we can learn lessons from. It's not just about offensive capability, it's about understanding uh, through intelligence networks um, the lay of the land. It's about uh, running um, rehabilitation programs uh, and, and getting a message through to uh, you know, potential jihadists or actual jihadists and turning them away. And I think they've had around about a 50% uh, success rate at rehabilitating um, insurgents. One of the things that has kind of come through a lot of the, the discussions here has been that many of the problems here are hyper-local. These uh, ISIS or Al-Qaeda or whatever is just the current brand that they are attaching to. The actual discontent or the uh, political motivations for many of these groups go back many, many years. Abu Sayyaf is a, a good example. They've been fighting for decades. The degree to which they are actually interested in ISIS's ideology is, is questionable. It's probably a pragmatic move, uh, as was as stated, uh, in order to raise their profile and get more funding. If ISIS goes away, if Al-Qaeda goes away, those problems don't go away, those political discontents. So what that means is that most of the groups are focused on their issues within their own territory. There is a handful of, um, of ideologues who are, uh, have a, a broader um, intent to, you know, kind of band the groups together, but it seems to be a very, very small portion of the jihadists who actually want to do that. So the majority of the counterterrorism action needs to be hyper-local, focused inward um, by the governments themselves onto the local conditions. And even within Indonesia, you know, across the 6,000 inhabited islands, you know, the provinces themselves need to focus on the issues within their provinces as much as across the country as whole. Well. So I believe there would be um, sharing. I can't tell you to what degree that sharing happens, but I will say that US and Australia is already uh, providing a lot of support, particularly to Indonesia, and that's been a uh, a large part of their success in um, combating Jamar Islamir in the, the early 2000s. Uh, I said, I'm aware, certainly with our country, the tremendous amount of intelligence sharing with Australia. Thank you for that. Mr. Skinner. Yes, um, as I said, Detachment 88 is a really good success story that can be modeled um, you know, in Malaysia and in the Philippines. Um, you have the Asian level of uh, where they, it's not threat information, but it's policies and capabilities. Then you go down to the Global Counterterrorism Forum, the JCTF, um, which all of the countries in the region are, they're very active and they have a really good hub and it's anchored by Australia. Um, the, the capacities differ because, and also the threats differ. The Philippines, they have a big problem in the South and that's a, that's almost beyond a CT effort, that's a military effort and the US is providing a lot of support. We have been for years and we're increasing it again. Um, 
Malaysia has, Malaysia has less of an organized group threat um, than they do, they just have a lot of people that are, have extremist tendencies and they're pretty good at arresting them. They, they have a very good intelligence service and they have a really good counterterrorism police. Uh, Indonesia, their problem is a resurgent Jamaa Islamiyah, I agree, um, that the, the depth and the history and the network of a JI in Indonesia just dwarfs Islamic State. Uh, now, Islamic State might make a push, their sympathizers. Um, I know that Singapore and Malaysia, obviously, with their border crossings, they have relatively day-to-day -day intelligence sharing. Um, and same with Indonesia, a little bit between Singapore. Uh, it's just the threat. It's so different in all these places, so it is hyper-local. But I, I haven't seen that, or haven't, and I, I talked to these people, I haven't heard that lack of intelligence sharing is an issue. Um, I mean, if the threat grows more broadly, then yeah, of course it'll be, because even in the best functioning governments or bureaucracies, things get through the cracks. But I think that they're probably doing well. What they need is um, you know, local solutions, which are in their hands, which we can empower. But I, I really believe that rule of law, counterterrorism specialties like Detachment 88 are something that's it's, it's very hard to overstate how much positive work they did uh, after Bali. And so if that can be replicated, and it is in varying degrees, um, that's a really low cost approach with a huge payoff. Ms. Peary. Um, while I agree that the issues are very local and engagement with communities will require uh, specific uh, policies between governments and their respective provinces, I do think the region has an opportunity as a region to meet and at least discuss certain macro issues from immigration to at least having unified laws with regard to banning uh, travel to join a militant group or going to a training camp. Uh, this, for example, varied greatly between Malaysia and Indonesia. Malaysia had outlawed, excuse me, outlawed uh, travel, you know, for uh, training in militant group long before Indonesia addressed the issue. And I believe as of last year, even in Indonesia, it was not illegal to join ISIS, but it had been in Malaysia for some time prior. Um, immigration and traveling between the region and going to you know, Europe or other parts of the world, these are opportunities to have better security measures and potentially even unify them in a way where you, at least things can be, travel can be tracked. Um, so there are opportunities for these countries in the region to compare and contrast what's going on and how they're being affected by each other. For example, as I mentioned, um, if ISIS can meet different militant groups in the Philippines last fall to talk about attacking Malaysia, there is a reason for Malaysia and the Philippines to talk to each other. And I assume that intelligence sharing is happening, but as Mr. Watts mentioned, I'm sure a lot of it, because it's happening now, these are, this is classified details that we're not privy to. But um, the details from community issues, whether it's Mindanao, or Aceh, that is local. Okay. Mr. Piri, Mr. Dr. Liao. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, yes, there's a fair a bit of uh, uh, information share, sharing and intelligence sharing amongst the security services um, of, uh, say, Singapore, Malaysia, Indonesia, Philippines. One of the problems, though, um, is that there are so, within individual countries, there are so many uh, intelligence services or branches uh, involved that it gets complicated. Uh, the, the, the information you get from uh, agency A as compared from agency B um, is, uh, could be different. So that poses a problem. And that speaks to the issue of uh, within these individual countries, uh, interagency cooperation needs to be improved. But over and above that, uh, from a regional perspective, I think the challenge now is for the, these regional states to go beyond information sharing, to actually consider, if I may say so, joint operations. I think it's about time they look into that. Um, uh, we, we think that, uh, well, I think that it is uh, very important to consider that simply because of the, the, the problems in the tri-border area that um, a number of uh, my fellow panelists alluded to. This is uh, between uh, the Sulu Sea, the Celebes Sea uh, in Indonesia, and the waters of the coast of Sabah. These are really ungoverned uh, areas, ungoverned waters, um, and these form very um, 
very effective communications and networks for militant groups and terrorist groups. Um, and it has been the case for, for decades. Um, and regional states have not uh, been able to, to mount any sort of uh, uh, joint operations uh, to deal with this threat. Uh, part of the problem is because they have their own baggage, right? Uh, for example, um, the, the Filipinos and, and the Malaysians are concerned that if you push co cooperation too far, this issue of uh, the, Philippi the dormant Philippine claim to Sabah, for example, will surface. So there are these, the, it, it does run into these issues, but at least as far as trying to cope with the, the threat of militancy and terrorism is concerned, I think that uh, some serious thought should be given to uh, joint operations or even having some sort of uh, a, a joint uh, security presence in that tri-border uh, area in the form of, of, of a base or a center or something to that effect. Okay, what exact area are you talking about now? Um, it is the, the waters that border southern Philippines, right. which is the Sulu Sea, um, northern uh, Sulawesi, which is the Celebes Sea, that's C-E-L-E-B-E-S, um, and the waters off the coast of Sabah in Borneo. So I, I have a map in my testimony uh, where it shows exactly where this area is. Great, thank you. Uh, rank member, Mr. Higgins. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just, uh, <clears throat> Ms. Perry, you, you indicated in your, your testimony that the largest population, uh, Muslim population in the world is in Indonesia and 70% of those supporting websites are from Indonesians. Um, but Southeast Asia has been pretty effective in suppressing uh, ISIS. So could you just reiterate the reasons as to why that is? Sir, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, sorry. Um, so the point I was trying to make was that in part of being proactive about moving extremist rhetoric away from the populations that are vulnerable to radicalization. One of the biggest issues is the fact that there's approximately 3,000 websites, pro-ISIS websites in the region. And the fact that 70% of the servers that host these websites come from Indonesia actually gives Indonesia a wonderful opportunity to be a proactive and aggressive um, and very quickly um, change the dynamic of ISIS's communications because the vast majority of uh, the hosting is coming from companies within Indonesia. I agree with you that in absolute numbers, we're not looking at a huge extremist problem. When you have over 100 million, 140 million um, Muslims in Indonesia and you know, approximately 300 that have gone to become foreign fighters. But what I'm concerned about on a broader level is the ideology and the attitudes of separatism that the ISIS message is spreading in these societies where prior to this extremist rhetoric, Indonesia has and continues to maintain overall a much more pluralist um, interpretation of its faith. So in, in preventing future change, which is why I mentioned what's happening in the UK as kind of a case study of what you don't want to become if you're not um, proactive now. So Indonesia is effective in integrating the Muslim population. I'm sorry? Indonesia is fairly, relatively effective in integrating. Well, not even just that. It's, um, it's Islam, as it's been practiced for centuries, has always been different. One of the issues with extremist rhetoric is that it's foreign-born, and it's come to the region from funding or extremist groups, and then it's proliferated through their proselytizing. So for Indonesians who don't have the identity issues that's prevalent in places like Pakistan or the relatively new nation states you know, of the Middle East, yeah. They know who they are, they know what their culture is. Is there an estimate as to how many uh, Indonesians are in Iraq and Syria as ISIS fighters? Uh, the numbers, depending on the source, vary as low as 300 and something and go upwards to 800. Is there a ISIS presence in India? At a speculative level right now, there, aren't, there isn't enough information coming in yet. Um, to show that there is, but there is, excuse me, um, there is AQIS, Al-Qaeda, and the Islamic subcontinent. And with that umbrella branch trying to unite um, Islamist groups between Afghanistan and Bangladesh, including India, there is um, increased uh, pro-ISIS activity from Pakistan to Bangladesh and with India sitting right at the center of it and being a specific target um, 
it, it's, again, low numbers right now, but the activity is legitimate. And so these are the, you know, as the conversations we're having today, it's so important to keep on discussing the role that extremist rhetoric is playing in these societies and trying to balance um, how we can proactively push back without being alarmist or without being um, unnecessarily aggressive. As Iraq and Syria continues to retake territory previously held uh, by ISIS, what is the impact of that phenomena on ISIS activity in Indonesia? Um, to be fair, I think that would be speculation on all our parts, but in my opinion, it would be um, an opportunity for them to focus on other regions where they have cells or have individuals that are sympathetic to their worldview. If they're going to lose territory in one place, they're going to try to get more elsewhere. Because they, for them, their uh, mission statement is global. But doesn't ISIS lose <clears throat> a very important component to its recruiting tool if it is perceived to be retreating as opposed to expanding? Possibly, but there are enough organizations that are like-minded from Al-Qaeda to Hizbut Tahrir to not remove uh, the risk of radicalization from Muslim communities. The point that I'm trying to make is this, that if our strategy mm -hmm. by sending more uh, U.S. troop personnel mm -hmm. to Syria and Iraq to combat the ISIS expansion, and if that's successful, aren't we, in effect, undermining ISIS' ability to grow in other regions? Not necessarily. Everybody agree with that? Um, it, again, it, it's, hard, it's speculative to, um, to decide. There's going to be two sides to it. The one is, for every action, there's a counter-reaction. So as we squeeze them in one area, they're going to look to survive. Again, endure and expand has been a, a key motto for them. So there is a, currently a debate amongst some of the, the senior leaders in, in Syria and Iraq as to whether they should um, maintain their territory, because that is a central message of why they differentiate from other terrorist groups, that they actually have actually established the caliphate that many others talk about and aspire to. They've actually done it. If they lose that talking point, their narrative is undermined. However, um, the, the group has been squashed before, almost within an inch of its life, and it's come back. And it's done that because it knows how to go to ground and disperse. So if the pressure on them becomes such that they make the decision that they can no longer hold the territory, they will make the pragmatic decision. As much as they're idealists, um, they are a very pragmatic organisation, and they will look for ways to spread that. Going to your earlier question about why has there not been a larger uh, attraction in Indonesia, I agree with everything uh, that Mercedes said. But it also uh, goes to the fact that those areas are, are politically empowered. The Muslims in those countries have actual political processes to achieve their ends. There are um, fundamentalist Islamic parties in Indonesia that have tried to go through the, the democratic process and have been rejected by the majority of voters. The difference between Indonesia and, say, Yemen or Egypt or, or any of the other countries perhaps in the Middle East is that the economic situation is better there, the um, political system is stable, they have political mechanisms to pursue their objectives and therefore they don't have to resort to the more violent uh, extremes. It also has to do with culture and messaging and many, many other things, religious traditions, but at a, at a very simple level that's a really important differentiator between countries in Southeast Asia and countries in the Middle East and that's why it's hard to compare the two. Thank you, Mr. Higgins. Um, just to, to add on to some of the, the points that my colleagues have raised, um, another, uh, let me start with the issue of um, uh, why, why there are so few uh, Indonesians. Um, I think uh, we, we have to bear in mind two things. Number one is that um, you have in Indonesia an increasingly conservative uh, Muslim society. So I'm not uh, entirely sure about, um, or I'm not entirely persuaded by uh, this, the, the, the orthodox view that uh, you know, Indonesian uh, Islam is, uh, has always been pluralist. Uh, I mean, for the most part, but they've always had a radical fringe uh, since, since uh, the 18th century. Um, so uh, the question is, f where does it get from conservative society to pro-ISIS? I think that's a very big jump. And that leads me to my second point. In Indonesia, in the radical... Uh, Muslim uh, intellectual community, there is a very intense debate going on now 
about this issue of whether Muslims are legitimate target of uh, terrorist acts. Um, and this is where a lot of the militant groups uh, differ. And this is where uh, Jama'a Islamiyah uh, has major differences with uh, the pro-ISIS groups because they are of the view that we should be minimizing uh, Muslim casualties. In fact, from, from Bali 20, uh, 2002, they've, they've been having this debate already. So this, I think, explains why on the one hand, you see a very uh, con conservative uh, uh, trends in, in Indonesian society, but on the other hand, it doesn't quite translate to uh, pro-ISIS uh, uh, support. Um, and um, also, just very quickly, there's also the issue of why uh, Indonesians and Malaysians are going to fight uh, in Syria and Iraq in the first place. Um, speaking to a number of uh, uh, in, uh, Malaysian detainees, it's, it's very interesting. For them, um, they buy into the eschatological logic of, of ISIS, that they are fighting the end times battle in Syria. Um, so if that's the case, it stands to reason that um, they won't want to come back. They want to fight the end times in Syria as they are called to. Um, in the case of Indonesia, on the other hand, um, a number of the people who have joined uh, uh, pro-ISIS groups have done so, uh, not so much because of uh, doctrine or theology, but because of personal allegiances um, uh, to, to individual uh, ideologues and leaders, um, which also means that um, they can sh shift. Uh, and indeed, if we manage to push back uh, ISIS, you might actually see that, you know, because a lot of them came from a Jama Islamia background, they could very well move back. And uh, just I'll end with an example of Abu Bakr Bashir, um, whom we all know, the, the, the spiritual leader of, of uh, Jama Islamia, who made an oath of allegiance to ISIS, and, but has since retracted that oath of allegiance, saying that now he understands better what ISIS is about and he doesn't quite agree with them today. So, so that phenomenon can happen as well. Uh, just real quickly, the, um, I think whatever, so the effort that we're putting in Iraq and Syria, whatever threat uh, that might come from squashing them there and like the ink blot where it goes somewhere else, and in particular here, uh, Southeast Asia, I think that is a manageable risk. Now, it's a real risk and it needs to be addressed, but I think it pales in comparison to the damage that if they lose that cal self-proclaimed caliphate in Raqqa, the damage that does to their global brand, because uh, a, lot of their st a lot of their worldwide allegiance is superficial um, bandwagoner. Uh, it, it appeals to a certain criminal mindset and a lot of disaffected people. So the damage to do to that group, one, it's a categorical imperative to help Syria and Iraq get rid of this, because for them it is an existential threat. So applying pressure there and toppling them there, yeah, it might lead them to look for other places. Libya is proving harder than they ever thought and because they don't have that sectarian wedge. I mean, they don't have that kind of wedge in Southeast Asia either. They have um, maybe ethnicity, but it's gonna be hard for them to play that card. So they're gonna to try to tap in to pre-existing networks that have a sanctuary, which is a couple places. Uh, but I think that the risks are manageable, but yeah, it's a real, it, it's a, you know, you'd be foolish not to think that if they get pushed out of there, they need a physical place Foreign fighters have to go somewhere. They have to have a place to put the black flag. It's not all propaganda. They need some kind of on-the-ground reality. Mr. Katko. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have a couple of questions, but I just want to follow up on what you just said with respect to the importance of having a caliphate in Syria and Iraq. First of all, Syria and Iraq are probably more unstable than most places in the world, and that was easier for them to establish it there. But also, one thing we haven't mentioned, it's fair to say that uh, the, money, the money flow is also important in Syria and Iraq. They have oil, and they have resources they can tap into there that they may not be, have access to elsewhere. And without money, they're going to be less effective. Is that fair to say as well? Yes. I mean, foreign fighters like to be paid. Um, <laughs> uh, you know, their logistics like to be paid. Um, they are able to buy weapons. That, you know, they're, not, they're not hurting for weapons in Iraq and Syria. And so cutting their money, is there isn't a downside to that. And so they, if they move if they splinter and some of them go to establish a Wilayat or even a caliphate in Southeast Asia, you know. it's going to be a shell of the organization. Mm -hmm. um, Syria and Iraq are the perfect place 
for them to thrive. Uh, they will not have that type of, they will have to revert back down to a terrorist group instead of a proto-state. All, right. All right, thank you. Now, I just want to, I, I, in my other capacity, my other subcommittee, I'm on in Homeland Security, uh, I was put in charge of what's called the um, Foreign Fighter Task Force, so I'm interested in the flow of foreign fighters. I know from Western Europe that there's thousands upon thousands of people that they believe went, and they think there's hundreds from the United States. I think both of those numbers are probably dramatically lower because we only, we only know what we know. We don't know what we don't know as far as how many have gone there. So I want to kind of probe you as to Southeast Asia. Um, I know these numbers sound very low, but how much confidence do you have in the numbers about the foreign fighter flow from Southeast Asia to Iraq and Syria? Anybody can take that. Um, yeah, it's probably low, um, but maybe not as dramatic as, the, the thing is uh, foreign fighter, especially it's, it's so weird. They were radicalizing in an open, you know, source. They were basically social media uh, announcing their radicalization. And then the government, you could count this up, and we did a lot of that, and the numbers would come close to what the U.S. government, with all their information, would uh, come up. Um, because these people weren't trying to hide. Uh, these were, but these are really lagging indicators. By the time you count these things, that's a year or two ago, I think the flows, uh, I think that we dramatically underestimated what was happening in 2013 and 2014, and that we're probably now trying to catch up, and we think, oh no, the flows are still that. So basically, the, that's why the estimates were all over the map. In 2014, we completely underestimated the size of the group, but also the size of the, I mean, there were a lot of people going there. And now we have got to understand that, I think the U.S. Department of Defense put out a number yesterday, that it's really dropped. And it took several years for that to happen. It wasn't just closing a border, it was, Everybody's stopping, most of these people are stopped at the airports. I would say, again, we constantly overestimate our ability to track foreign fighter extremist travel. So I, I and I mean, even here, I, 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 there are people that have gone that we don't know. Uh, and so it would be foolish to think that in Indonesia, uh, that that number is exactly 600 or, because it, it could literally be between like 500 to 700. Um, but that's that we know of, and that's what they announce. Some of it's uh, open source, some of it's not open source. And so I, I really think that, and I, in my old job, I was always optimistic. The problems were never as bad as they seemed. The more you knew about it, it was never as bad. But with foreign fighters, I, I think that, and we've just, we haven't proven the ability to monitor this, and we're, we're way behind the curve. All right, Mr. Watts. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, excellent question. Um, I haven't studied this in detail, so I can't say any, with any confidence in numbers um, specifically, but I will say that the, um, what I have seen, what I've read and researched, there is some very, very specific information where they've spoken to the individuals involved and they can actually track specifically, you know, person number one went to his friend and asked how to get to wherever and he got knocked back and went to friend number two who got put in touch with friend number three. They have some very specific information. Uh, as mentioned before, the, the counterterrorism efforts in Indonesia in particular um, are very sophisticated. They rely on heavy intelligence and human sources. They have informants within some of these groups. They know where they are. Even if they can't affect them, they know where they are. They know what the networks are. They know who the key personnel are. So um, I absolutely would agree. We can't say specifically how many numbers are and we can't really be sure. But I think that we can have some confidence that they're not radically different to what they are, because they, you know, there would be some sign of it within these networks. The informants would have picked it up. You know, these groups are quite tight knit. Um, you know, there is literally a handful of key personnel who everyone knows and speaks to and, and interacts with. So I think we can have some confidence that while they might not be exactly what we're seeing, they're not going to be radically different to the numbers that have been quoted. Uh, and I just wanted to to point out with the foreign fighters, as much as the foreign fighters coming back, I'd like to, you know, um, reinforce the the comment that was made earlier. Those that are going over predominantly want to be there because they want to be there, not because they want to come back and, and, and bring the skills back. It's a very different mentality. But even if ISIS went away, even if um, Al Qaeda went away, the terrorist threat in Indonesia will not necessarily, or Southeast Asia, will not necessarily be less because, again, those motivations for those groups, the um, political grievances are local as much as they are the broader ideological. So that doesn't necessarily shift the threat analysis. That's a perfect segue to uh, my question for Dr. Liao. Well, more of an observation, really. You've indicated, I think, in your testimony that we must take care not to exaggerate the threat uh, of ISIS in Southeast Asia and that ISIS right now isn't the biggest threat there, and I think that's consistent with what Mr. Skinner is saying in his testimony as well, and that, that's understood. I mean, it's not the biggest problem right now, but um, uh, I think it's probably different in Western Europe than, than, than it is for Southeast Asia right now. 
But I mean, given, despite that, can any of you tell me if there's any particular area of Southeast Asia where you're most concerned about the possible rise of, of, of uh, ISIS-related activity? Uh, maybe I'll start. Um, a specific area, I think, would be the Sulu archipelago, Basilan, the island of Basilan, because, uh, uh, again, as I mentioned earlier, it's ungoverned space. Um, the Philippine uh, military, I mean, I have friends in the Philippine military, but if you look at the chairman mentioned the the, the operations uh, in uh, on the ninth of uh, on April 9th. Mm -hmm. um, I think that was um, uh, quite uh, an embarrassment for the, the Philippines uh, Special Forces. Um, and it's not an isolated uh, incident either. Um, so um, the capability, the capacity that the Philippines has to manage, to deal with the threat in that area is very low, is very low, um, which is why um, I suggest, my, my view is that we have to really look beyond just joint uh, information sharing. You've got the information, you've got the data. They still cannot do anything uh, with it. We need to really look at uh, operations. The US, to some extent, is already uh, present there. Uh, the Australians, I think, would, be, would take an interest as well as a number of Southeast uh, Malaysia, Singapore as well. Um, but, you know, it runs into issues of sovereignty and, 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 and things like that. But that area, in terms of a specific geographical area that would be a source of concern, that would be it. Um, whether it's ISIS, whether it's uh, uh, Jama Islamia, Abu Sayyaf, etc., um, it's all happening there. Um, if I can just uh, react very quickly to your sure. earlier point about the numbers, um, I agree with my colleagues, it's not a precise science. Um, I think the, the, at least the figures I've, I've seen are about 700 in, in total Southeast Asians, uh, by far the majority from, from Indonesia, um, uh, a handful from, from Singapore, and there, there are suspicions, there are a handful from Philippines as well, but n not confirmed. Um, I think we have to bear in mind two things. The first thing, as I, as I mentioned uh, in my testimony, that uh, uh, certainly in the case of, of Indonesia, uh, we notice a large number of women and children who are going there because they are relocating, they are doing the hijra, right? The families are relocating to the pristine Islamic state. They're going to stay there, they're going to, you know, um, uh, grow up there uh, for better or worse. Um, second point is um, there's quite a significant casualty count uh, as well. Um, as far as the Malaysians are concerned, if we work on the premise that there are about 100 there, um, uh, figures I've seen, and you can actually get it uh, off, off YouTube where, where there, there are a number of clips uh, where militants talked about, they, they actually talk and film uh, information about operations that they had conducted a few, years, uh, a few days uh, prior. Um, and there are at least about uh, 12, 13 uh, Malaysians that have already been killed uh, in uh, Syria and Iraq. Um, mostly in Syria, one uh, in Iraq. Uh, in the same manner, uh, Indonesians as well, we're talking about, uh, about 40, 50 of them. Um, so this is about uh, roughly about 15%, uh, 20% of the, the, the figures that we're talking about. So there, there, there is a casualty uh, count as well. I just wanted to put that out. Thank you, Mr. Skinner. Yeah, I agree. Um, there's two ways to look at it. Uh, the Southern <clears throat> Philippines would be the perfect large-scale ISIS presence because uh, that area is not going to be controlled anytime soon, hasn't been for decades. Um, that provides them a sanctuary, uh, a place to literally stay and to recoup or to rebuild and also to plan. I mean, that's what they do. That's why we try to deny sanctuary. Uh, so if they got there, I would probably say that's the number one spot. Uh, another concern is what we're seeing in Bangladesh is truly horrifying because we are watching in slow motion but real time how this extremism works. Um, it's not that they have the best message, they just need to be the, be the monopoly of the message. And they, to do that, it's not a metaphor, they literally kill the messengers. And so we always talk about credible voices and these people need to stand up, well they are, and they're getting slaughtered. And in Bangladesh, um, that would be a, from a, I mean I focus on counterterrorism, and that would be a nightmare scenario. Uh, Bangladesh is, for all its problems, a relatively stable society. They have a lot of weird politics, but so do we. Uh, <laughs> and so um, I, I think that what we're watching there is this slow motion slaughtering of other voices, uh, and they're targeting, their, these are not randoms. They're go going at you know, certain alternative voices. 
and mainstream even. And so if you start seeing that in Jakarta, if you start every now and then you see blogger killed in Jakarta or uh, new, you know, weird newspaper killed in Kuala Lumpur, and you see that a couple times, that is a real sign of a society that, um, that there are not just gangs and criminal gangs, which they, ISIS is basically a criminal gang, um, but they are making a push to frighten. All they want is people not to speak up. They don't really care if they believe them or not, they just want them to be scared. And hacking people to death with machetes, it doesn't cost anything, uh, and the payoff is huge. I think that southern Philippines would be a territorial gain for ISIS, and they might try to go there, they might not. I mean, if I was in my wood, there's no cost, why not? Um, because it's so uncontrolled. But if you start seeing in the cities uh, attacks on media, news, bloggers, radio personalities, that is a real, real bad sign. All right, thank you. Mr. Rotz. Uh, thank you, sir. I just want to, to point out a few other areas. I mean, as I mentioned in my testimony, you know, some of these areas have grievances going back 50, 60 years back to the independence of Indonesia. Any of those areas that, um, you know, have links way back to Dar al Islam, uh, areas of potential uh, hotspots again. Um, in, in Indonesia, specifically Poso and in, in central uh, Sulawesi, there's known cells there. Some of the groups are operating out of there. Again, the Indonesian uh, government and police forces know this. They're watching it. They're conducting operations as we speak to try and eliminate that. But that, that's an area where there is a local sympathy for the broader cause, uh, if not the methodologies. The area that I think is of, of great concern is Aceh. Aceh has for a long time um, been a, an area of insurgency with Indonesia. It sought autonomy for a long time. It's been very quiet in recent years, um, but that's mostly due to the tsunami um, from you know, about a decade ago. And there was a huge amount of piracy in that region. There was a huge amount of insurgency in that region. And quite literally, the pirates' boats got wiped out by the tsunami. And the impact that it had on the region saw that the insurgents and the government forces come together to try and repair. That's now, we're now seeing the effects of that wear off and we're seeing the you know, old animosity start to grow out again. There's already been some training camps um, identified in Aceh. It's an area with, again, long-standing um, discontent and political grievances. There is a, a deep sense of uh, needing autonomy for the region and whether or not, and it's Islamic as well and they want to see Sharia law imposed, but it's autonomy as much as anything. Again, whether ISIS is there or whether Jamar Islamir is there, that area is going to continue to be a hotspot where in Insurgent groups and terrorist groups are going to want to operate out of. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Katko. Uh, again, I would ask all, all four panelists uh, if ISIS did decide to officially designate or associate itself with one of the organizations in the region, what impact would that have? And also, is ISIS considered a competitor to, to Al Qaeda in that region, or are they looked upon as being the same? Yes, Ms. Eddie Perry. Just a specific aspect to your question. There is a possibility that if ISIS did become affiliated with a specific group in Southeast Indonesia, there is a fear that what the, to now, uh, these localized groups have a questionable levels of training and sophistication and capability, that that capability would increase um, with the influence and help of ISIS militants from the Middle East. Um, and I think that is a concern country to country, because as um, has previously mentioned, there are hubs, there are already certain training camps present. Um, if there is increased collaboration, there is a potential for greater sophistication. Um, there's one example that I have of a, uh, in early April, a Moroccan bomb maker named Mohamed Khattab was killed in the Philippines. Um, this was the incident in early April where uh, reports had uh, mentioned 18 uh, law enforcement soldiers that were killed mm -hmm. in a skirmish. So. Again, right now, we're limited to specific incidences here and there. And, um, but increased collaboration is going to raise these questions in terms of scenario building and trend watching that what was before uh, specific militant groups with specific issues in their region um, fighting with their local or federal governments, that the uh, expansion of targets would become more indiscriminate because that is ISIS's preference. They want to create chaos. So what was something that was happening in, excuse me, what was, uh, let's say, series of skirmishes in Mindanao might be uh, Kuala Lumpur or larger uh, cities across the region because that's what ISIS needs to make the next video. Skinner, yeah. Yeah, that's a really good point. Um, uh, we're having this, it's not a debate, but in the U.S., uh, we're sending additional special forces or special operation forces to train and advise. 
And you only need, as you know, uh, these people are very skilled, and you only need a couple of them to act as a force multiplier. I think that if, and they, they're probably trying to do it now, ISIS to send them to wherever their home countries are, but if they make it official, which they've been pretty hesitant to do, and they declare a Wilayat in Southeast Asia, yeah, they might try to send some of their best trainers. And just as we believe in, you know, training advise, so do they. I mean, talent goes to talent. And so if they send a couple good trainers, it'll do two things. It'll create, increase the lethality to, of these groups. It'll also, it might cause some kind of bandwagon thing where a lot of rival groups that aren't ideologically, you know, they're, they're just more like rival small gangs, kind of join up, and that increases the manpower of that pre-existing group. ISIS isn't replacing these groups. It's, it, it's not like they're moving an army from Raqqa to, uh, you know, Mindanao or something. No, they're just plugging into these pre-existing groups. And so if they, if they go all out and they make a big media push and they put their caliphate on the line and say, there's a new allied here, they might get more capability maybe a little funding. It, it's hard to know how much they can go. You know, we're trying to decide in Boko Haram, too, if that's happening. But it certainly would increase some kind of support for the young kids. Um, but there is no love lost between J.I., which is still the major threat there. They're just the established, they're the mafia there. They've been there forever. Um, they might get off, the best ISIS can try to do is try to um, do what they're doing in the Taliban and try to splinter some stuff off. Um, but the most important part is they're going to broaden. If ISIS goes there, they're going to go from attacking a local police station for a real reason to attacking anybody anywhere. I mean, that's their motto. And so if they do that, you'll see just an indiscriminate campaign. Mr. Watts. Just two points. Um, it was mentioned earlier, I think, by Dr. Liu. Uh, there is debate within um, the... Uh, the groups within Indonesia, the, the jihadist community, within the conservative community, about whether or not they really um, uh, appreciate or, or um, agree with ISIS's methods. And there's a huge amount of jihadist groups who reject them for that very reason. So the question of would there be competition? Absolutely there would. There is a... Um, the, the split between uh, Jabhat al-Nusra uh, and ISIS in Syria caused huge rifts within some of the key members within the jihadist communities in Indonesia as, as some back the al-Qaeda um, back groups and, and some went with, with ISIS. So there would be tensions and, and problems between them as to who would align with the other and there'd be problems with ISIS's methodology and ideology for some of those groups. Having said that, um, to focus purely on Islamic groups or jihadist groups I think would be short-sighted. Again, in, uh, ISIS has been uh, has shown itself to be extremely pragmatic in the way that it creates alliances and the, the very um, uh, alignment between the Ba'athists and ISIS in the early days of their expansion is a perfect example of that. If groups within Indonesia who may not um, have an ideological alignment with ISIS see that there is some benefit to jumping on board, getting funding, if there's something that they're going to gain from it, they may band with them even if they don't buy into that ideology. So I think there's two aspects of that that needs to be uh, considered. Thank you. Um, I think that the, 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 the threat, the concern really will be um, about uh, groups in the southern Philippines. Um, and uh, in the sun, southern Philippines, you have uh, a whole, uh, you have proliferation of militant groups and they're always looking for an ideology. Um, and they would go uh, with the flow. I mean, Abu Sayyaf group, a prime example, you know, align themselves with uh, Al-Qaeda uh, and now they are aligning themselves or certain factions in it aligning themselves with ISIS. Uh, you know, very conveniently disregarding the kind of uh, differences that Al-Qaeda has with ISIS, right? Um, so I think the malleability of um, the ideology of southern Philippine groups, I think, would... Uh, would uh, would be a cause of concern as far as uh, ISIS looking to work with, with groups in the region uh, is, is, is the issue. Um, in the case of Indonesia, again, uh, there's rivalry between pro and, uh, and anti-ISIS uh, groups. The danger there is that the Indonesian government is starting to give publicity and a platform for anti-ISIS elements who are from the jihadi community. You know? So they are giving Jama Islamiyah leaders a platform from which they can discredit ISIS. But uh, there is a problem there, quite obviously, because these, these, these people have a jihadi agenda as well. You know? And um, they will very quickly be able to use uh, 
the, the visibility and publicity that they have been given to advance that agenda. So I think that there's an issue there. Um, and uh, a last point I would raise is, um, I think a, a, a big concern which we didn't talk about uh, is uh, the case of Malaysia. Because unlike Philippines and unlike Indonesia, Malaysia, you're looking at the individual radicalization. And uh, the nature of this sort of radicalization is that it is much more difficult uh, to monitor and much more difficult uh, to deal with as opposed to looking at groups. Thank you, Dr. Liao. Any, any further questions, Ranking Member? Okay, go. Okay. You know, it's, it's my uh, job now to thank you for your testimony, but I want to tell you how sincerely I mean it. This was as enlightening as any testimony we've had before this subcommittee, or quite frankly, I think uh, even before the entire committee. This has been uh, extremely helpful. Uh, you put it in terms that all of us can understand, which is somewhat of an achievement. I want to thank you for that. Now, the members of the subcommittee may have some additional questions or witnesses. We ask to respond uh, to those in writing. And pursuant to committee rules, the hearing record will be held open for 10 days without objection. The subcommittee stands adjourned. And again, thank you very much.